All right, good morning, guys. All right. Uh, today we're going to cover uh, inverse trig uh, integrals. Um, we'll have two days of test review and then a chapter five, six test next Thursday. Uh, I'm still trying to finish up grading that calculator portion of the chapter four test. I'm almost finished with it. Um, they'll go in the grade book this weekend and I'll hand those back to you Tuesday. If there's any recoveries that that you would like to do on that test, um, it'll it'll happen the following week. So you'll definitely have a week to to review and come in uh, for health session or come in for uh, uh, corrections. Okay, but I'll enter that in over the weekend. Um, I should also be able to finish grading your quiz, 5.2, 5.5 quiz. Just looking over it briefly, it looks like you guys did pretty well there. So I will have that in the grade book and I'll hand back, hand those back to you on Tuesday. So I'll hand, uh, um, so everything should be up to date by next Tuesday. Okay. Okay, if you guys can turn to page 23. Okay, so, um, okay, page 23. Now, first semester, um, we talked about uh, these inverse trig derivatives. And just to kind of review them, uh, these are, um, I think we recognize these as kind of like the most complex looking rules here. But we also talked about ways to uh, see uh, <clears throat> similarities to kind of help, uh, uh, help remember these a little bit easier. Right? We talked about how uh, the numerators, they all have u prime. The denominator, they all have one and u squared. Uh, our tangent looks the easiest because it has just a plus sign and no square roots. The complicated looking ones are the arc sine, where they both have square roots, but we talked about how arc sine, arc secant, um, we have this way of uh, understanding that because the u's are next to each other, so that helps us remember u squared minus one is for arc secant. And if we know u squared minus one is for arc secant, then arc sine, is going to take on a different order, one minus u squared. Okay, and we also talked about how you know these are the, th the three rules for inverse trig derivatives, but we also have three others. But these three others are just the negative versions of the ones next to it. Okay, so arc cosine is just a negative version of arc sine. Arc cotangent is just a negative version of arc tangent, and arc secant is just a negative version of arc secant. Arc cosecant is just a negative version of arc secant. Right, and all the c uh, functions. Uh, are the ones that produce the negative derivatives. Now, because we learned these derivative rules, we also are going to learn the integral rules. And integral rules are just essentially working backwards from these derivative rules back up to the function level. Now, there are some um, uh, distinct differences, but I want you to look at least the similarities here, right? You can see that. The du over square root of a squared minus u squared kind of resembles the u prime over root one minus u squared. You have the instead of the a, you have the constants. Instead of a, you have the one, but then the minus u squared, the square root is similar, and it produces arc sine. I know that we have that a 
that makes things look a little different. But I, right now, I just want to kind of help you see the similarities that we're just kind of working backwards from these derivative rules. We've got the one plus u squared that looks similar to the a squared plus u squared. The antiderivative produces our tangents. Okay. Uh, the du over u squared u squared minus a squared looks like the u prime over f's value of u over times squared of u squared minus one. That produces our secant. Okay. All right, so we're just working backwards from these derivative rules from first semester. Okay, so okay, so now let's look at these integral rules here, inverse trig integral rules. Uh, the first thing I want you, us to be able to identify is the a and the u value. Okay, now if you're looking at a problem, we have to be able to identify what's the a value and what's the u value. Otherwise, it's sometimes it's hard to distinguish between these rules. Okay, the way that you tell is you look to see what's the constant and what's the variable. Okay. So the A is going to be the constant. So if you see a constant in the denominator, that's going to be your A value, or that's going to be related to the A value. Okay, we have some adjustment we have to make, adjustment that we have to make, but it's going to be related to the A value. Okay. If you see the variable in the denominator, that's going to be um, how we're going to work towards getting to the u value. Okay, So the way you distinguish between the a and the u value, the a is the constant and the u is the variable. Okay. Now looking at these uh, rules here, um, again, the arctangent is the easiest one to identify. There's no square root. Okay, arc sine and arc secant, sometimes uh, they look so similar that it's hard to distinguish. And sometimes the U is not quite there yet in the beginning of the problem, so it's hard to tell which one is the arc sine, which one's the arc secant. So I think the uh, the foolproof way to tell between the, the difference between them is you look at what comes first and what's positive. Arc sine is always going to have the constant value come first and, and be the one that's positive and the variable is going to be the negative one. But the arc secant inside the square root is going to be the variable that comes first and the constant coming second. Okay, so I want to kind of point that out. I know sometimes it may be easier to just think, well, why can't I just rely on this u value outside? Whatever there's a vari variable outside the um, the radical, then it must be our secant. But sometimes that u value is hiding at the beginning of the problem, and it's not really easy to tell. So the best way to tell is to look at what comes first inside the square root. If it's constant, then it's arc sine. If it's a variable, then arc secant. OK, so let's look at example one here. Example one, we always want to go down our checklist of options, right? First option is expansion. But there's too many terms in the denominator. We can't distribute this. Even if, we, even if we could, we can't really make much progress. If we go through our normal u substitution, right? Let's say we let our u value be the x squared minus 9. The derivative is 2x, and that 2x is not going to, is nowhere in the numerator for us to match and cancel out. So our normal u substitution didn't quite work. So now our next option is matching it with one of the arc sine, arc tangent, or arc secant. Okay. Now, right now, it's hard, kind of hard to tell. But what we want to do is once we identify that this is an arc trig problem, we want to create two sets of parentheses inside or in the denominator. OK. So this is what we want to do first. We want to rewrite it because we need to pull the A and the U value first. So this is the way that we're going to do it. So you're going to uh, force your um your radical to show parentheses squared minus parentheses squared okay so we're trying to force the x squared and the nine to sit inside a set of parentheses with exponent outside but we don't want to just carry whatever that we see down we have to make sure that whatever we insert into the parentheses squared is going to end up being the same as our starting problem okay we don't want to change the overall value we just want to change the presentation to make it easier to identify the a and u value because a lot of times the NU value is not quite what you see in front of you. So what can I insert in, into this first set of parentheses? 
x, right? x parentheses squared is the same thing as x squared, so that's that's an easy um, um, that's an easy uh, uh, easy for us to to bring down. Now the next thing is, what can I put inside the set of parentheses so that something squared equals nine? Three. Three. Okay. So there are there is a time when the number is going to be the same, but the only time that happens is if it's one. Okay, if it's one, then one squared is one, but if it's any other number, you never want to put the same number in here. Okay, it's not going to be the same. Okay, the purpose of this is so that we can pull the A and U value correctly. Now, now we're just looking inside the parentheses. Okay, the variable is the U value. The constant is the A value. So the A value in this case is just three, right? We made the adjustment and we're not going to make the mistake of saying that A value is nine, the A value is going to be three. The U value is just the X, okay? Whenever you pull the A and U value, just look inside the parentheses, okay? Don't involve the exponent outside the parentheses for your A or U value. Now we can go through our U substitution step. What we want to do is we want to make it match the rule that we want to apply. Okay, so it looks like this is shaping up to be potentially our secant rule. The variable is the one that's positive and coming, coming first, followed by the constant. Let's find du dx. Okay, du dx equals one. We solve for dx. dx equals du. So now let's go ahead and replace every x with u, every dx with du, and every constant with a. Now what we want to do is we want this to look like the rule that we want to, that we want to apply. Okay, if we can make it look exactly like the rule that we want to use, then we have an integral rule that we can go to next. Okay, so I'm going to pull the 5 out in front. Uh, that's just a coefficient. And I like to have the du over to the side, even though the rule has it above in the numerator. It's the same thing. But I'm just going to replace every x with u, every constant with a. I just want to be assured that the rule that, I, that I'm going to use is, going to, is available to me. I want everything to be matching to the t. So once I make those substitutions, if you look, right, if I were to cover up the 5, I have everything matching perfectly, right? And I need everything to match perfectly if I want to use a rule, right? Integral rules are very finicky, right? If it doesn't match exactly, then we don't have a rule to apply. It's got to match. Every piece has to match if we want to use the rule. Right? It's very restrictive. So now that we have a perfect match with the rule, we're ready to jump into uh, our antiderivative. The 5 is not part of the rule, but it's a coefficient, so it has to stay at, um, in our answer. Next up is 1 over a. What's our a value? 3, so 1 third. Our secant, the u value is x, so put it in that form, ask the value of x over a, which is 3 plus c. Okay, you leave it like this, but I just see a quick way for me to clean this up a bit. I'm just going to make it 5 thirds. Okay, any questions with one? First things first, can we expand? We could, but we're not going to be able to make it where we can split up into in, uh, individual fractions. There's too many terms in the denominator. Uh, if we let the u value be either the parentheses or parentheses squared, we're not able to get it to look like a rule that's available to us. So we're kind of stuck not using any of the old rules. So we look to our trig. What's the best fit here? Expanding x minus one. Uh, well, if we expand x minus one, we, we lose the ability to find. But just between these three rules, though, which rule is best is best fit? Arc sine, arc tangent, or arc secant? 
our tangent, yeah, there's no square root. I think our tangent is the easiest one to spot, okay? Now, there's another thing that I'm leaving out in terms of uh, distinguishing why it's arc trig, but I'm gonna save that till I go through each of the problems, okay? All right, so let's do this first, right? Uh, we need to get two sets of parentheses to show up. If we wanna, if we wanna commit to our trig, we really need to get our A and U value identified correctly. Okay, so we're gonna force a set of parentheses in the denominator, and that's a it's a it's a helpful tool because that way we're not pulling the incorrect A or U value. Okay, All right, we need to put four as something squared. What can I put in here? That's the same thing as four, two. Right, number is always going to be different. Okay, A is always going to be different than what you see in the problem. Here, this is already set up nicely, so we can just drag that down x minus one. Okay, good so far. Okay, what's our A value? <clears throat> good, right? So you you force it in this form so that you can identify the A and U value more clearly so that it, it sticks out. Right, U value is just the X minus one. Again, never include the exponent outside the parentheses. Okay, that's to help you create the form, but you're not gonna use it for your A or U. Okay, DU DX. Um, that X, what's the derivative? Oh, okay. Just one, yeah, just one. So DX equals DU. All right, so make our substitutions, the two, dx minus one, the dx, we wanna replace those. And the point is, we just wanna make double, we just wanna just get confirmation that the rule that we have is available to us. We wanna match with the rule that we were expecting to use. No coefficient to keep track of, no leftover terms. This matches perfectly with the rule that we want to use. Right? I put I pulled the du outside, but it's the same thing. Right? One over a squared plus u squared times du. So we're ready for our rule. One over a. Let's go ahead and make that substitution. What's the a? Two. Our tangent of u over a u is x minus one over two plus c yes Oh yeah, the d over dx is just the derivative of u. So I find the derivative of u with respect to x, and then and then I'm and I'm able to get d x equals du, so I can replace dx with du. And once I do that, it should match perfectly with the rule that's above. Okay, example three. Uh, expansion. We can't do too many terms in the denominator. U substitution is not going to work either. If we let the U value be 16 minus X or the denominator, the 7 minus 16 X squared, the derivative will be negative 32 X. And there's no X in the numerator to pair up and, and, and get rid of. So uh, a, a normal U substitution is not going to quite work. We look to our trig. Which do you think will be the best fits? Our sign because? There's no outside, but then what's first? Is the constant, right? The positive is the constant. So that's what's indicating clearly that it's going to be arc sine. Okay. All right. Let's get the denominator to be in the proper form. So let's get two sets of parentheses to show up. Okay. How can I uh, rewrite this problem so that something squared is equal to seven? root seven. Okay, let's double check. Root seven squared is root seven times root seven, which is seven. So we haven't made any changes. We still kept the overall value. Okay, what can I put inside the parentheses so that when I square it, I can achieve 16 x squared? Four x, let's double check that. Four squared is 16. 
x squared is x squared, so we're good. Okay, so now we're not having to guess what the a value is and the u value is, right? So now it's sitting there for us for us to uh, quickly um, identify. A is the constant, and u is the variable. Okay, next up, let's find the du dx so that we can uh, convert everything to be in terms of a and u. du dx equals 4, cross multiply. I'm sorry, 4 dx. Okay, now there's some left over here we got to keep track of, right? Okay, so piece by piece here, I'm going to replace the root 7, the 4x, and dx in terms of a, u, and du. Let's see what we have. Almost matches the rule. I mean, it does match the rule perfectly, but what can we push out in front? One four. Okay, one over four. Okay, does this match perfectly with our arc sine rule? Yes. All right. Okay, so look at the arc sine rule. Arc sine rule is the only one without a one over a coefficient. It jumps directly into arc sine. Right, the arc tangent arc secant, they both have one over a. It's the arc sine that doesn't have it. Um, so we're going to jump directly to arc sine, but we do need to keep that one fourth. So we'll bring that one fourth down. No one over a, just arc sine. U over a. Okay, guys, there's no need to rationalize the denominator. If you leave a radical in the denominator, that's perfectly fine. College board accepts it as well. So. That's sufficient. Okay, questions, first page. Now, the first page, everything, I mean, we had to we had to make some adjustment, but it was relatively easy to quickly pull the A and U value just with one step, right? Now the second page, we're gonna see that these problems, the denominator is not quite set up the way that they are on the first page. The first page is set up nicely. Second page, the denominator, we're going to see these trinomials that's not quite set up for us to pull the ANU value as quickly as first page. So we have to go through a cleanup method. Okay, and that method and that um, uh, step is involving completing the square. So we're going to complete the square to allow for our ANU value to appear uh, more prominently. So if you look here, number four, dx over x squared minus 6x plus 13. Let's go down our options here. Expansion, too many terms, can't do it. U substitution, uh, it's not going to quite work. If our u value is the denominator, the derivative will produce 2x, and there's no x in the numerator to cancel anything out. So we have to explore potentially an arc tangent rule. But this arctangent is not quite as easy to pull the a and u value, right? We don't have something that's binomial squared that we can pull the u value. I mean, we can factor the x out, but it's not going to quite fit. Yes. Um, why can't you use the power rule? The reason why is because um, there's if we bring the numerator, if we bring the denominator to the top, it becomes x squared minus six x plus thirteen raised all raised to the negative one. We can't distribute the negative one through, and it's just a, one, one big mess. Now, if I have three terms above and one term below, I can split up into individual fractions and I can do it. But anytime I have more than one term in the denominator, separate by plus or minus, yeah, yeah. Oper operationally, if we bring it up, it's still inside a uh, set of parentheses. We can't get to it. OK, so we're going to step to the side and we're going to go through completing the square. OK, I'll, I'll go through each step along the way okay? because I know that's probably been a while. But we're going to step to the side and we're just going to work on that denominator. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, identify that it's a standard form, which it is, x squared, bx, and c. 
and you want to separate your variable away from your constant. So I want the x squared minus 6x together. I'm going to create a space between my constant and the variable. So plus space. And then I'm just going to copy down my, my constant term. But whatever number I decide to add, I have to make sure I immediately subtract it away because I don't want to change the overall expression. So if it's plus three, I need a minus three here. And if I have a plus six, I need a minus six here. I don't want to change the overall expression of my original uh, denominator. Now, we're trying to find a value that will allow a trinomial to factor nicely because right now this is not going to factor nicely with that. That's going to create a duplicate uh, factor. So the way that we can get there now is there's a formula and that formula is b over two squared. Your b value is always the second term, the coefficient of your second term. So what's our b value here? Okay. Don't worry about the negatives, okay? Um, because it's just gonna end up being squared. It'll end up be always be positive. So don't worry about the negative, just include the number that you see, okay? Six over two is three, three squared is nine insert the nine in the two spaces okay they'll both be the same number now this should factor nicely now okay multiplies to be nine adds it to be negative six what do we have yeah negative three negative three and they should always be duplicates because the point is that we want to write this as a binomial squared. Now we're able to kind of have a path towards getting to our u value, okay? And then the constant, we just merge those together, was 13 minus nine, four. Okay, so now let's reset. Let's go to the top of the page, and now let's pretend this is the beginning of our problem, like the first page. Okay, this is a lot more um, familiar because we can visualize where that U value and the A value is going to come from. But again, we're going to create two sets of parentheses, right? So now this is our new beginning. Now that we've gotten that denominator cleaned up, okay? No, no changes here. It's already set up nicely for us. How about the four? What can we put inside the parentheses? Two, right? Two squared is the same thing as four. Okay. A is the constant. U is the variable. All right. Du dx, derivative. Just one. Just one, yeah, derivative, just one. Okay, so now let's put everything in back to the problem. We want this to look exactly like the rule that we're about to apply. I have it at the top of the page here. We want it to look like this our tangent rule. Matches perfectly, no coefficient. Okay, we're now ready to, to um, go to the right side, okay? 1 over a, what's our a value? 2, 1 half. Our tangent, u over a, plus c. Guys, cross off number 5. I have another problem. This is a little too complex for what we need to do. But any questions with what we've done so far. Okay, this is from the textbook here. I call this this is from this is number 41. So you guys can copy this down here, number 41. Cross off example five. We're gonna do a problem that is more um, more what we need to to be responsible for.
OK. We go down our options. Too many terms in the denominator. We can only do power rule. There's only one term in the denominator to bring it up. Not easily brought up. If we let the U value be the entire denominator, that degree is going to produce 4x cubed, and there's nothing close to 4x cubed up top. So we know we're not going to get a, a, a matching uh, canceling out of x's. So now we explore the possibility of our trig, but to get to our trig, we need this trinomial to be cleaned up. So we got to go through completing the square. So I'm going to set things up for complete the square. Put a space between the second and third term and a space after this, the, the third term. The first term is always positive and the last term is always negative. Good, OK. So uh, our formula here is B over 2 squared. Our B value is that middle coefficient or that middle um, constant. 2 over 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. Yep. So now we're just focused on the first three terms to get it into factored form. Yeah. One multiplies to be 1 and adds it to be 2. 1 and 1. But this x to the fourth, we got to break this down into what? Yes, it's not x and x, right? It's x squared and x squared. So everything is kind of raised one degree here. Okay, that's a good sign that x squared plus one squared because we can write this now as a binomial squared. And then the resulting constant is going to be what? Plus one. Okay. okay, let's reset. Now we have a more familiar problem. Looks more, um, more like what we saw on the first page. It looks like it's going to be a nice fit for our tangent. There's no square root. Uh, but we do want to just. Yeah, just for get into a good habit of always creating two sets of parentheses just so that you're making sure that you're not accidentally pulling the wrong U or A value. OK. A is the constant inside the parentheses. U is the is the variable portion inside the parentheses. OK, derivative du dx 2x. Go ahead and make your substitutions. The u, the a, the du needs to appear, and we're hoping that the x that we left there will take care of itself. All right, what do you see? Mm -hmm. But first, x's go away. The leftover of of what? One half. Okay, so pull that one half out in front, and we should be able to confirm that this matches exactly like the arctangent rule. Right, everything matches perfectly. There's not a single thing that's different. You know, assuming that we're covering that one half up. OK, we're ready for our tangent rule. One half comes first. That's not part of the rule, but it is a coefficient. Times, what's next? One over a. What's our a value? One. So it's not going to change much, but just to I like to write it down just so I can confirm that I've taken care of everything. Okay, our tangent of? Mm -hmm. OK, so this is perfectly fine if you leave it like this, but this is a quick clean up. So I'm going to do it. OK, any questions here?
Okay, how to get a one half. So the derivative of x squared plus one is two x. Right, and so when I find, uh, when I cross multiply, I get two x dx equals du. So dx must be du over two x. And if I replace dx with, sorry, if I replace dx with du over two x, the x is canceled out, but there's that two hiding in the denominator, so I'm pushing it out as one half. Because that's at the beginning of the problem. So that X uh, is kind of, uh, we, we left it there in the hopes that it will cancel out once we got through this process, and it did. Yeah, so whenever we find a derivative, we always want to have something in the problem to kind of pair up and cancel out, right? We don't want to have any leftover hanging X's in our problem. Our X's have to find a way to um, to pair up nicely so that they go away um, so that we can match with our integral uh, use substitution rule. OK, now we've covered through all the integral rules that we're responsible for, OK? Um, but I think some the, the the challenge is looking at a problem with no you know um, uh, with no uh, indication as to what rule to use, and to be able to to know what rule to apply. Right, looking at a problem and saying, wait, is this power rule? Is it use substitution? Is it change of variable? Is it long division? Is it synthetic division? Is it arc trig? Right, looking at a problem sometimes it's hard to to know what rule you're supposed to do. It looks like you're just taking a stab in the dark. But um, I want to kind of kind of go through some things that you can tell by the setup, by the degrees to help you indicate, at least give you some direction um, so that um, you're able to jump to the correct rule um, because it's hard sometimes when when they all kind of look similar to each other. So if you go to page um, 25, I wrote a lot of things down here, but I just want to kind of uh, just highlight a, a few things. And then on page 27, I have problems that look very similar to each other, but there are some distinct differences to help us indicate: is it power rule? Is it is it use substitution? Is it is it um, long division? Is it synthetic division? Is it um, arc trig? Right, thank you. So let's look at uh, page 25. I just want to highlight a few things here. I think um, sometimes the most difficult part is looking at a problem and just being um, just being thrown off by the parentheses. Uh, I think a lot of times we see parentheses and I think our natural inclination is, oh, it must be used substitution. But if you look at these problems here, there's parentheses all over the place, but these are these are perfectly expandable, right? Three minus X squared, that's not too hard to expand. And that root X, there's it's only one variable in the denominator. We can easily bring that up and distribute through and clean everything up and separate everything and just rely on power rule. Okay. And also understand that for the most part, if you attempt use substitution for power rule problems, you're not going to be able to, to get things to work out. Okay. Same thing. This second example, this looks rather potentially complicated, but you see how there's only one term in the denominator? There's no multiple terms. There's not like three roots, root x plus three or plus five or minus two. This is one term here. We can quickly separate into individual problems and then we can really have, we can really treat this and turn this into three separate problems with each with their own rule. So whenever um, you have only one term in the denominator or if it's perfectly expandable, then that's always your first option. Now, if you're unable to rely on power rule or expansion, then you can explore use substitution. Okay? And use substitution, a lot of times, we're looking for a set of parentheses with a degree that is high enough that will match and pair up with the lower degree left over X in the problem. Sometimes we got to go through change of variable when um, the X's are not in line with what we want, but we go through a second set of substitution to get that X to be replaced in terms of U. And then how do you tell between using something like long division or synthetic division? 
Okay. First step is you make sure that your there's more than one term in the denominator, which there is, which means we can't just expand. And also you look at the now you compare degrees. If your numerator degree is the same, if not higher than the denominator, then that's usually a good fit for long division or synthetic division. Okay. If the numerator degree is higher than the denominator. And then you look at the denominator. Okay. If the denominator has an x to the first power, then you're welcome to use synthetic division. But if it's x squared or anything higher, we got to rely on long division. Okay. And now that brings us to our trig. The way you can tell our trig is if the denominator degree is more than the numerator degree, but there's a gap, okay? If the denominator degree is higher than the numerator by two or more degrees, then usually that's an R trig match. Okay. Now, going back to page 23 uh, and 24, let's look at all the problems that we just did and look at all the degree differences. I know there's a square root here, but really, you see how the denominator has x squared and numerator has x to zero power. You see how there's a gap of there's a two degree difference gap between denominator and numerator. That's a that's a potential fit for our trig. Here, I know this x minus one looks like a like a um, uh, it's a linear, but then that's squared. You see how this there's a tip there's essentially x squared below and nothing up top. There's there's a two degree difference, right? Anything with a degree with a difference of two or more degree with the denominator being higher, that's indication that it's probably going to be our trig. Okay, look at example three. X squared below. Nothing up top, right? Two two degree difference. Okay, look at number four. Degree two, degree zero, two degree difference. Example uh, number 41. Look at that. Degree four, degree one. That's an even larger gap. Right, so if the gap is two or more, with the denominator being the higher one, then our trig is going to be the better fit. Yes. Um, what degree still be Which one? Three. Yes, I yeah we, we do see the square root, but then our if, if we want to do anything with u value, it's going to be. It, you know, if we assign the u value, it will never involve the square root, right? So you really want to kind of pinpoint what's inside. I know we see the square root. Ultimately, it is a degree one because of the canceling out. But in terms of the u value, um, there's a two degree difference. Okay. But yeah, you're right. We're in some cases we have to kind of ignore um, the outside portion to see that distinction. Okay. Now page 27. Okay. Let me just quickly go over these here. Now all these problems, they kind of look the same. Okay. Now first row are ones that are suitable for um, expansion, potentially power rule. Row two is just a normal use substitution. Row three is long division, synthetic division, and row four is arc trick. OK, so I want to kind of highlight those differences and then I worked out the problems on the back page on page 28. You see how there's only one term in the denominator here. We don't really care about the degree difference. OK, there's only one term in the denominator. I'm instantly thinking that I can separate into two, three problems and just treat them like three problems rather than dealing with one problem. OK, so that's the indication that no use substitution yet. You want to separate into individual problems. OK, now look at the second row. You see how the denominator has a degree that is exactly one higher than the numerator. That's a good indication that a, a regular u substitution should handle should handle this problem. If the u value is 7x squared minus 2 minus 4, sorry, 7x squared minus 4, the derivative will be 14x, and 14x will handle that 5x nicely. Right? If our u value is 3x cubed minus 4, uh, 9x squared will handle the 2x squared nicely. So if the degree in the denominator is one higher than the numerator, that's a good indication that that we're going to be able to go through nicely with u substitution, regular u substitution. Third row. Okay, look at how there's more than one term in the denominator. We can't split up, but now the degree in the numerator is higher, right? X to the fourth versus x squared, or the same, x to the first power, x to the first power. These are indications that we can use synthetic or long division. 
Okay, long division can handle uh, this. Uh, long division or synthetic division can do this, but this one will only be handled using long division. And now look at the last row. De denominator has a higher degree. Degree two versus degree zero. That's a two degree gap. So that's a good fit for our trig. Degree four, degree one. I know this is square root, but ignore the square root. Look at the degree without the square root. X to the fourth, X to the first power. That's a three degree gap. That's more than two. That's two or more. So arc sine. Okay. So I'm hoping that you know giving specific distinctions and rules can kind of help you decide so that you don't feel completely lost looking at a problem going, I have no idea what to do with this. Is it is it synthetic? Is it long division? Is it is it use substitution? Is it arc trig? Is it power rule? Right. And a lot of times, if it's numerator and denominator, look at that degree difference. Okay, that can help us decide. Okay, I have one more problem that I want us to do. We're gonna do this problem here, and we're gonna uh, do this problem on uh, that space that you have on, on page 26. So copy this problem down. Integral of 5x over square root of 1 minus x to the fourth. Let's get, just get another arc trig problem. Um, okay, so page 26, there's that gap. You can copy that down here, page 26. Right, use substitution is not going to work. Now we now we kind of see it, how to distinguish, right? You see that x to the fourth, that x to the first power. That's a that's a sizable gap. Use substitution alone is not going to close that gap for us. We're going to have to rely on our trig. To rely on our trig, though, we do need the, the denominator to be in a certain form. Let's get two sets of parentheses to show up. All right. Um, any changes here? What can I put in this first set of parentheses? One. Just one, right? One squared is one. No changes. Okay. What can I put inside the second set of parentheses? X squared. Okay. Because x squared squared is the same thing as x to the fourth, right? I haven't changed anything, but I've made it easier for us to identify what we need from this problem. Okay. Your a is the constant inside the parentheses. Your u is the variable expression inside the parentheses. And now we're just trying to get to solving for dx so we can replace dx in terms of du. Okay, du dx derivative of u with respect to x is 2x. Cross multiply. Make your substitution now, right? Replace the one, replace the x squared, replace the dx. We'll leave the 5x alone, but I think we can kind of see uh, things will work out pretty nicely with that derivative here. OK, what do you see here? Do the x's go away nicely? Yes, right. But there's a leftover of five halves. But once that five halves come out, it should match nicely with arc sine, right? Arc sine is the only rule without the one over a in front. So coefficient first jumps directly into arc sine, and then u over a. Yeah, we gotta we gotta memorize them. Okay. Now, um, we do have homework. Uh, from 5.7, I'll send out a reminder Monday afternoon okay, that I'm going to be checking uh, on Tuesday. Two days for test review and then Thursday test. 